Okay, so welcome back to uh, Inside the Black Box again. In today's episode, we are going to look at the Timex Sinclair TS-1000, which uh, in the UK was better known as the Sinclair ZX81. Um, now, this computer, if you are from the US, you probably look at it and go, I've never heard of this thing in my life. Uh, but if you are from the UK, you're probably thinking, wow, what an absolute classic. Uh, and the reason for that is because this machine was originally designed and produced in the UK uh, by a company called Sinclair that was a very kind of uh, exotic, uh, in crazy inventor guy called Clive Sinclair who actually did some really, really interesting technological advances in his day. And he's really the person who is responsible for bringing home computing uh, to the British Isles. Uh, and so his company designed and produced essentially this computer. The American release had some uh, slightly, slightly different changes to it. Uh, but it was essentially this computer. And the thing that made this computer amazing in its day was the price, right? This was the computer which really allowed almost anyone in the UK to have a computer at home, right? If you had a TV, you could buy this thing, plug it in and away you went. Uh, and it came with basic right out of the box. So if I turn this on right now, uh, I would see a basic interpreter so I can start writing programs. Uh, I can plug in a regular cassette tape drive and then I can buy uh, programs for it. And they of course came just like a lot of computers from the 80s uh, on a regular cassette tape. The programs were saved on here. Uh, and it didn't need a special tape drive. Uh, any regular cassette tape that I might have had at home, I could just plug in and then just use it for reading. Uh, when this computer came to the US, uh, it was the first computer in the US to sell for less than $100. It sold for $99.95 uh, in 1981 values, which today would have been about 250 bucks. Uh, which, you know, if you think about it, a whole computer for $250 is really not bad. Um, so this particular model was given to me um, as a donation by a guy called Larry. Thanks, Larry, very much. Uh, I've been looking for one of these for a while. Uh, and this one kind of comes with all the trimmings because not only do we get, you know, checkbook manager, it's, you can't buy this stuff anymore, um, but you get this, which is the addition, additional RAM pack. So uh, this computer, when you buy it out of the box, this is what essentially what you get in the box when you buy it. Uh, it comes with either one kilobyte of memory, which is in the UK, and in the US it's shipped with two kilobytes of memory, uh, which is a reasonable amount of space if you want to kind of mess around and try some basic programs. But if you want to get serious, you get the RAM pack, which gives you an additional 16 kilobytes of memory, uh, which in its day, of course, was quite amazing, right? This is from 1981. Um, so the reason I want us to uh, look at this, apart from the fact that if you are, you know, from Britain or the Commonwealth, in, it, in itself is just worth uh, propping open because it's such a historic piece. Uh, this is a really good example of what a, a computer from the early 1980s looked like inside. It's quite simple uh, because all of the components that make it up would have been quite expensive and Clive Sinclair was all about making this cheap and affordable and democratizing computing. So it's very simple on the inside and it'll be very easy for us to start to learn how computers look like on the inside. So later when we start opening up more complex machines like you know the Nintendo Famicom or the Game Boy, um, we'll understand how things go. So uh, let's have a look at it on the outside. Um, first of all, uh, it's got a definite um, industrial design to it. Uh, it looks quite different from machines that were its contemporary. So if you think about it, this machine was shipping simultaneously to the Apple II, uh, the Hewlett Packard HP 85, which were just kind of big beige blocks. Um, Clive Sinclair was very big on making his machines, even though they were supposed to be affordable, he made them look nice. That was one of the things that he wanted to do. He wanted to have a company look, all his machines were black to begin with, uh, which made them stand out from everybody else who was doing kind of beige or tan colors. Um, and this actually won a number of British design awards back in its day. Um, the design itself was done by a in-house Sinclair designer called Rich Dickinson. Um, and it's very simple. So what you have is uh, the machine itself. It's very light. I mean, it's not meant to be portable. You need an entire television to plug this thing into, uh, but it's nice and small. Uh, on this side, we've got a couple of ports. So we've got a uh, TV here. That's where you would plug your TV to get your display picture. Uh, ear, mic, and nine volts DC, right? Nine volts, you would just plug in the adapter which came with the device. Uh, but really you could have used any adapter as long as it was able to provide the right number of amps. Um, Ear and mic are very important. Ear you would have put to, um, you know, either a set of headphones or something else that would be able to replay the sound. The sound was just beeps and bops, right? It was like very simple. It doesn't really have uh, a dedicated sound chip like the Commodore 64 had or the Nintendo. Um, mic is very important. Now, why do you have a microphone 
uh, socket in this computer. I mean, it's not like you're going to hook this up to the internet and do Skype, right? Uh, the reason for that is this, right? If you are going to uh, load your cassette program in, that you you put this into your regular cassette tape that you had uh, sitting at home, right? And if you play this, it makes that cassette tape noise, beep bop, beep bop. Well, the output of the cassette tape would have plugged into the microphone jack and that's how you would have loaded your programs, right? So perhaps this should have been labeled tape better than mic, but well, there it is. Um, apart from that, there are a couple of other interesting things. Let's look at the back first. The back is very simple. Uh, it has like a lot of the computers in the 80s, this kind of uh, card edge connector, which is for expansion cards. And I already showed you the memory pack, which plugs into the back here. There we go. And it's kind of uh, wobbly. Can you see it moving? That was an interesting design flaw. Uh, of course, this has got your memory in it, the RAM. So if this wobbled while you were uh, using the computer, it could cause crashes and instability. Uh, and that was a, a well-known design flaw with this machine. Um, they kind of fixed that on the ZX Spectrum, which was the, uh, the next model to this. Um, other than that, it's very simple. It's got a, uh, this is the American model, so it's got an FCC warning at the back. Uh, interestingly, manufactured in Portugal for some reason. Uh, Timex was actually a Scottish company, so I'm not sure why they were manufacturing in Portugal, but anyway. Uh, and of course, being American, it's got the ability to select channel two or channel three on your TV. Uh, the British models did not have this. Um, the final interesting thing about this machine is the keyboard. So uh, let's get a little bit closer and examine the keyboard in detail. Okay, so the keyboard is one of the key ways in which Clive Sinclair managed to reduce the price of this machine because rather than using the standard kind of, uh, you know, s separate keys on a spring and a switch, which uh, is what they used to call a real keyboard uh, in those days. That's, for example, what, uh, you know, an HP 85 would have had, the Commodore 64, VIC-20, Apple II, etc. They instead use this membrane keyboard technology which was not invented by Sinclair. Some calculators and computers of the day had this. But the important advantage to this is that it is very, very cheap to manufacture. Essentially what you have is two layers of plastic. Uh, the bottom layer has got essentially two metal contacts separated and the top layer has another metal contact on top. So what happens is when you're not pressing on it, they are separated. And then when you apply pressure, you squish it down, the top part comes into contact and closes the switch, right? And then when you let go, because the plastic has kind of got, you know, it's, it's rubbery and it's got a bit of memory to it, it'll then pop up again and break contact. So you can't exactly touch type on this. Uh, they have absolutely, you, you feel almost nothing when you push these. Um, you would have gotten feedback on the screen, all right? Uh, what's interesting about this though is how much stuff they pack into every single key. Look at a single one of these keys, like this S key, for instance, right? So on top it says save, in red it says L print, it's got the letter S, it's got a kind of graphical element that looks like uh, half filled in block, and then it's got arc cars underneath. What's all that stuff that's piled in there? The reason for that is because depending on which one of the modifier keys you press, for example, you'll see the shift key is in red. What that means is if I press shift S, I will activate the red function, which is L print. So if I needed to do an L print while I'm writing my basic program, right, and all these red things are basic keywords, um, instead of typing out L print, I would actually press shift and then press the L print. Why did they do that? The reason they did that is because they were trying to save memory, right? If I want to have a basic interpreter that is capable of when I type L P R I N T, decoding that into the instruction L print, that takes space, that's code that has to go somewhere inside the computer and I will need more memory and therefore the computer will be more expensive. By forcing the user to do that for you, by giving you a single command, you essentially make the computer cheaper, right? And this is something that was shared with the ZX Spectrum, which had a slightly better keyboard, but not that much better than this. Um, and so essentially that uh, tokenization step where you convert a word L print into the token L print, right? The basic command, uh, by forcing the user to do that, they were able to save some money. And there are other uh, command keys around here which you can use to do the various other things all on this key. What that meant, of course, was when you started using this computer, uh, if you wanted trying to type in a program either from the manual or from a magazine, uh, you had to really look through all the keys, okay, L print, which one is it under? Uh, so it was a, like a pretty steep learning curve. Uh, but then when you got used to it, I guess, you know, it, it uh, 
it went a lot faster. Uh, so that is actually one of the interesting things about this machine is what it has what we would consider a crappy keyboard uh, but actually it was designed to really be uh, optimizing for being cheap to manufacture uh, so that you could have you know the cheapest computer sitting in your living room and hey better some computer than none right uh, so that was kind of the theory behind that okay so that's the uh, Timex Sinclair uh, 1000 on the outside. So let's go, before we take this thing apart, let's go to the whiteboard and just quickly walk through, uh, in theory, what does a simple computer like this look like on the inside? What are the parts that make it up? How do they come together to do what it does? Uh, so that when we open it up and start looking at chips, it makes a lot more sense. Okay, so let's talk about what the basic architecture of a uh, generic 8-bit computer from the 80s would have looked like. And by architecture, I mean, what is the kind of very simple black box diagram of what a computer looks like, right? And essentially all computers, even the ones we get today, you know, your fancy iPad, um, you know, your big desktop PC at home, even your TV, which is basically a computer, looks the same way. So in the middle, we have the CPU, which is the central processing unit, right? That's the smart bit, which actually uh, is capable of doing logical operations on some data. Uh, and it'll basically take in some data, which is just ones and zeros, right? It's just uh, uh, binary data. It'll apply some logic to it, and then it'll transform the data out. So for example, it might take a number, two numbers, add them together and output the result, right? And that's really all it comes down to. So then what you have, uh, in order for this to be useful, because this is just on its own, it does nothing, we need to add a couple things. So we need to add, what we call IO, which is input output. So we want to be able to put in data to the CPU so it can do something. And then we want to be able to get results up, right? So your input might be a joystick and then your output might be a TV, right? Or the input could be a disk drive and the output could be a sound card, right? So there's going to be some devices that allow you to put in data into the CPU so it can process and then get them out. But in order for a CPU to work, it needs some space in order to you know, store things while it's halfway through doing a calculation. Uh, or maybe it wants to read a big chunk of data and then uh, do uh, many different operations to it. So we need some form of memory at the bottom, right? And so what happens is information will come in uh, from an input. The CPU might then decide to put some of it to memory. It'll process some. Uh, it'll be reading and writing from memory back and forth. And then at some point, it'll give you a result out, right? Uh, and so these two pipes that we've drawn here are essentially buses. And when we talked about cartridges, uh, you probably know these are your data and address buses, which are here. And then there is an IO bus, which is the special connections which connect the CPU to your IO, right? So that is, in the very basic terms, what a computer looks like on the inside. Now, let's go just one level into it and see what else is there. And now we start to get uh, somewhat specific to what the 8-bit computers were like, because modern computers have... When you go one level down from here, they look a little bit different. But for the simple computers which we're interested in, uh, let's break into this a little bit. Let's start off with I.O., right? So typically on a computer from the 80s, I.O. would have been split up into essentially two kinds of device. You would have had a display, um, and your display typically would have been a TV, and you would have had a special connection from the CPU to the TV dedicated because remember like display is a lot of what you're doing right I mean there's no point doing a bunch of logic and maths if you can't show it to the user so often a lot of the you know CPU time and a lot of the code was dedicated to driving the display so that is a special uh, IO device and then you get the other IO devices um, which during the 80s the big things would have been for example um, joysticks keyboards uh, and printers, right? Dot matrix printers, me, 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 those things. Um, disk drives, uh, we'll talk about disk drives, etc. in a second. Uh, so here you would have had your peripherals, and they would have had typically had some bus, typically a very simple bus. It might not even have been a bus at all. It might just have been direct cables between the CPU and the plug, right? Um, so for example, uh, I believe it was in the uh, Commodore 64, the joystick ports that led directly to the CPU, there was nothing in between. I may be wrong about that one. Somebody can correct me in the comments. Um, so <clears throat> these are the two kind of main categories of IO devices that you had. Um, what's interesting about the display, of course, is being a TV, you need a little bit of extra stuff because 
TVs were designed to take a analog radio frequency signal, right, uh, from through an antenna, uh, decode it into a picture, and then put that on the screen. Uh, it's not like today where a TV has got a dedicated input where you can put pump a picture directly into it, like for example through HDMI or through S video. Um, the early TVs, all they could understand was radio frequencies that they picked up through an aerial. So early computers actually had a box um, between the TV and the rest of the computer, which was called a modulator. Modulator. And what the modulator did was actually take the image that the computer wanted to display, encode it in such a way that it was exactly the same format as the radio frequency signals, and then it would output it through the antenna of the TV. So you kind of faked doing a TV broadcast in the modulator to get the image on, onto the TV, right? Um, and that's part of the reason that uh, the TV pic the images produced by these early computers were often not great quality and very fuzzy was because you lose a lot of signal like you you putting the uh, the electrical signals that you're pumping from the CPU towards the display have to go through a whole lot of components in the modulator every component adds a little bit of fuzziness and so you know it wasn't as it's not as clean as when you take a signal directly from the CPU to your monitor you know through a dedicated line something like S video. Um, so then what about memory? Let's break into memory a little bit. Typically, the early computers had three kinds of memory. Uh, and here I'm going to do something which some people are going to disagree with. But anyway, trust me on this one. Um, you had, of course, your uh, random access memory, uh, which is the memory that uh, the computer can read and write from. And that's kind of its working space, right? Uh, when it loads a program, it gets stored in RAM. And then... Um, it can write to it to make modifications. It's like a kind of scratch pad where it kind of holds stuff temporarily while it's working with it. Um, and this is when you talk, when you ask someone, hey, how much memory does your computer have? That's the number you're typically talking about, right? The more RAM you have, the more kind of interim storage the CPU has and the more useful it is, typically speaking. And, you know, in the 8-bit uh, days, this would have ranged anywhere between, you know, one kilobyte up to an absolute maximum of 64 kilobytes because that's set by the address of the uh, the width of the address bus but you had other kinds of memory too uh, all of these early computers were fitted with read-only memory which was not writable by the cpu it's actually a different technology of silicon chip uh, and it's only readable now why do you want only readable memory it doesn't seem very useful well you need to store somewhere how to draw the letters of the alphabet on the screen right they have particular shapes that's got to be stored somewhere um, the computer, when you turn it on, boots up into BASIC, right? Well, where is the BASIC program stored? It's stored in the ROM, right? Uh, where is the fact that when you turn on the computer, it says, you know, copyright Sinclair 1981. Where is that stored? It's stored in the ROM, right? So everything that the computer kind of knows out of the box uh, was stored in the ROM. Um, and so that is also connected through the same uh, data and address buses. So in other words, the 64K limit that one of these 8-bit computers would have had would have been for RAM plus ROM. So in the case of the ZX81, um, it shipped with 1K of RAM if you had the British version and 2K if you had the uh, Timex uh, TS-1000. And then the ROM was actually 8 kilobytes. So it actually had way more stuff in the ROM than it had in the RAM. And the ROM had BASIC and various other things which were useful. Um, so you could expand this computer by adding an extra uh, memory card which was just RAM, so RAM cart. But no matter how big this RAM cart got, all three of these things together could not be more than 64K because that's the width of your address bus, right? Unless you start doing exotic things like bank switching, etc., like the Nintendo carts did, okay? And then the third kind of memory that you have, and this is where it gets, I'm gonna do something a little unusual, is your disk, right? Uh, sorry, let me not say disk because disks weren't really around in those days. Let's call it external storage. Um, and your external storage in the case of the ZX81, of course, was a cassette tape, right? Just a regular old cassette tape. Uh, and that is a form of memory. And the reason I put the, cassette, uh, the external storage here next to memory and not here with the peripherals through I.O. is because typically uh, computer designers think of memory as being in kind of layers from fast to slow, right? So inside the CPU, there is a, 
absolutely tiny amount of storage which is called the registers and they might only store like say 10 bytes if that right depending on the cpu but accessing that stuff is very fast because it's right inside the cpu then my next layer of storage this is called l1 l2 is my ram and rom um, that that i can have more of because it's cheaper memory right it's it's slower therefore cheaper so i have a little bit more of that uh, and then I have a third level, level three, which is this, L3. And this stuff I can have a lot of, like, you know, a tape might have been able to store many, many times what the RAM can store, but it's very, very cheap, so it's okay. And the idea is that this is how computer designers trade off storage, speed, and cost, right? If you did everything with L1 uh, level cache, the computer would be amazingly fast, but it would be super expensive. So you kind of trade off the cost amongst the three. But that's basically what a 8-bit uh, computer looked like on the inside, right? The CPU is the, uh, the bit that does the logic. You've got your I.O. on top. Uh, your display was a big thing. Peripherals, which are going to be your joystick, your keyboard, whatever other things you have plugged in. Uh, sound would have been another peripheral. And then you've got memory, which is your, your different kinds. Your L1 cache. Uh, RAM, which is uh, either built into the machine or in your cartridge. ROM, which contains all the goodies like basic or everything a computer knows from startup. And then your external store, which is the programs that you load. Okay, so I've undone the screws on this. It's just got a couple of screws. Like a lot of these devices, um, some of the screws are under these uh, little feet. Uh, there's a technical name for these in engineering. They are called LRFs, which stands for little rubber feet. And often designers will hide the screw under the LRF just to, you know, make it look nicer. So let's pop the top off. Uh, very simple case. Just two pieces. Let's grab those screws. Uh, the inside of the case is kind of reflective. Uh, it's got a kind of thin metal coat to it. This is part of the FCC required shielding, uh, which we've talked about in the past. The European versions of this machine didn't have this level of shielding. So you may ask, hey, why, if you have to design shielding for it, Sir Clive, why don't you just, you know, give this with the European machines? And the answer is because you can save a couple of cents, right? You can make the machine a little bit cheaper if you don't have the metal shielding in places where it's not needed. So um, this is then the machine on the inside, and you can tell it looks pretty simple. It's got one giant PC board. Uh, this time the solder mask is red. You know, why not? It doesn't really matter. Uh, this band here essentially connects the shielding on the front half to the shielding on the back. So when I close this, uh, the metal part would make contact on this band. Uh, of course, you don't want this band touching any of these uh, pins at the back because you would get a short circuit and destroy your machine. So it's got this extremely cheap cardboard backing, uh, which is prevent supposed to prevent you from, from doing that. Uh, so the PC board is kind of uh, screwed in tight here. So let's undo that. Um, just got two screws, uh, and here you can already see it says uh, Sinclair 1981. Um, so this is an early release of the machine. The ZX81 did extremely well in the UK. It sold, I think, two and a half million units. Uh, in the US, it sold pretty well very soon after it was released, and then sales kind of slowed down and it, uh, it died. It didn't have as much of an impact here as it did in Europe. Uh, okay, it's got all kinds of interesting stuff in there. All right, there we go. So that's what it looks like. It's very, very simple. Um, it's essentially the main PC board. Uh, it's got this giant block here, which is actually the uh, heat sink for this piece here, which is the uh, 7805 voltage regulator. So this converts the nine volts, which you're gonna plug in here into uh, five volts, which is actually what's used internally uh, by the machine. Uh, some of these parts here are filters and so on to make sure that the uh, electrical signal you're getting is clean and it doesn't have any spikes. Uh, and then this stuff here, um, these are the extremely cheap ribbon cable that connects the, m the main motherboard to the keyboard, which is, you know, sitting down here. Um, and what's interesting about it is it's, it's got very few cables, right? I mean, there are how many keys on here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4. So there's about 40 keys on here, but we only have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, why so few cables to drive these many keys? Well, much like the uh, NES controller, um, this thing uses some multiplexing logic, uh, which is inside this chip here, which we'll get to in a second, um, to essentially require fewer cables than there are keys. You don't want to have a lot of cables because as we talked about, cables are expensive, right? Uh, so you want to do it in logic if you can. Uh, all right, let's zoom in and have a look at all these chips. 
Okay, let's uh, go through these parts and see what's what. So starting at the bottom here, this funny kind of silver box, that is the modulator which we talked about, right? Uh, this essentially will take the signals from the CPU to draw whatever picture or text it needs to, convert them to the same format as the radio frequency that would have been broadcast by a television station, uh, and then that will go through this plug here to the antenna socket on your TV, right? Uh, so this essentially is like a mini TV broadcast thing. Well, it's not broadcast because it's going through a cable, but it's like a mini TV uh, station. Um, this thing over here, as we talked about before, that's the 7805 voltage regulator. Very, very common component. You will find this in pretty much every electrical device before, I don't know, 19, the, before the year 2000. The, these things are very nice. Uh, they are super cheap if you're looking to, uh, ch if you need to knock a voltage down to five volts, this is like the standard piece you use. The downside with them is that they get hot, right? Because of course you're taking a large amount of energy and making it become a small amount of energy. That difference has to go somewhere and the, way, the place it goes is into heat. So they will typically put a heat sink uh, into these chips um, Sinclair just used a giant block of aluminium here rather than a kind of more elegant heatsink. Hey, gets the job done, it's super cheap, why not, right? Um, then you've got, you know, a number of jelly bean parts here, just regular resistors and so on. And those are really just supporting uh, the main players here, which are uh, these chips. Uh, which way do I need to go? There we go. Uh, so let's go through these very quickly and you'll see how they map to what we were discussing on the whiteboard. So let's start at the top here. We've got this uh, Toshiba part TMM2016P1. This is two kilobytes of RAM, right? So that is the memory which the CPU will use uh, internally. Uh, if you want to have additional memory, of course, this is the card edge connector here into which we will plug our uh, memory module, right? Um, and if you are crazy enough to follow these tiny traces, you can actually follow them to the CPU to see which legs they connect to. This chip here, which is actually la uh, labeled Sinclair Research uh, D2364C, uh, copyright 1981, uh, although you'll see here it's got another code that says 8234. What 8234 means, it was manufactured on the 34th week of 1982, which uh, 34th week would have been, I guess, around October, right? Uh, this Sinclair Research chip is the ROM, right? So this has the Sinclair Basic interpreter, it has the hello message when you turn the TV on. Uh, it has got the shapes of the letters on the screen. It has got the logic to decode uh, the keyboard. Uh, all of that kind of stuff that it, the computer just knows when it boots up is stored inside this ROM. And this is eight kilobytes. Uh, so in other words, you've got four times more stuff here than you can store up here, right? Um, then this piece here, let's just move this capacitor out of the way. This one here is kind of the magical one, right? Uh, and if you look, it says Zilog. Z80, Z8400A, which is a Z80A CPU. So this is the CPU. This does all of the logic. It is able to read and write from memory. It is able to drive the peripherals and it is able to output a signal to the TV to create the picture, right? And the Zilog Z80, uh, it's, not a, it's not a chip that was custom built for Sinclair. Uh, for example, this chip here, which is branded Sinclair Research was done by them. Um, or more likely they had somebody make it for them because they didn't have a chip manufacturing plant. The Zilog Z80 is an off-the-shelf CPU, which was very, very popular during the 80s. Um, it was used in a lot of computers, so uh, the ColecoVision used it. Um, it was used by uh, a lot of British computers that were made at the time. It is used as a sound processing unit in a lot of arcade games. Uh, that, for example, Bally Midway would often put Z80s to do sound generations inside their games. Um, and it even got used for strange things like early versions of the Tomahawk cruise missile used a Z80 for guidance. So uh, it had a lot of different applications, a so very popular chip. That's important because devices that are popular and sell a lot are cheap, right? So this might have cost, you know, Sinclair maybe, you know, a, a pound or a fraction of a pound to buy to put inside here. And then this device down here, uh, which is labeled Ferranti ULA, um, this is um, essentially a glue logic chip. So what this has is it's got some custom circuits uh, which connect these things together. So it will help the CPU build the TV picture. It'll help the CPU read from the ROM and RAM, etc. 
ULAs are basically a way of putting extra circuitry in a more compact format. So instead of having, you know, a bunch of resistors and capacitors and stuff, you have it inside this very compact format. Um, and it, even, it actually turns out to be cheaper if you manufacture in enough scale, right? And remember, they sold like two and a half million of these things. So they probably saved a lot of money by using a ULA. Um, today, uh, ULA is a different word. You'll hear for it is an ASIC, A-S-I-C. I forget exactly what it stands for. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is Ferranti is a British uh, electronics company. So this really makes it, you know, be a completely British machine. Uh, and that's really it, right? So all of the pieces that we talked about on the whiteboard are here. CPU is here. We've got memory, um, RAM and ROM. Uh, if you want to do storage, that comes out of here. You've got your uh, uh, microphone, ear and mic. Um, then you've got the, the display, which is this piece here. And that's it. That's your entire computer. The ULA just kind of helps glue everything together. So super, super simple. Uh, and yet, you know, it's a computer that introduced home computing to just millions of people during the 1980s. And it essentially helped bring together uh, the British revolution of computing. And in fact, uh, some of the people who founded Acorn Computer uh, worked at Sinclair in its early days. And the reason Acorn Computer is important, uh, you probably have not heard of them, except if perhaps you've heard of the, model, uh, the BBC Model B computer. Um, but Acorn, uh, at some point, stopped making computers by themselves, and they just started designing CPUs. Um, and they developed a thing called the Acorn Risk Machine, which is the ARM processor, right? So this, in some sense, is the computer that inspired the people who build every single mobile device, your smartphone, uh, your tablet, etc. right? So that's kind of a cool piece of history. There's one last kind of interesting technical point I want to share about this machine, um, which is about the uh, Zilog Z80 processor. As you can imagine, this processor was not very powerful, right? Um, the most powerful processor, of course, would have been more expensive. So Sinclair chose something kind of middle of the road in terms of price. Um, this is the same processor that existed in his previous computer, which was the ZX80. And the ZX80 had this interesting kind of annoying behavior, which is this. This CPU, remember, it has to drive both the logic of the program and create the picture on the display, right? It's actually not powerful enough to do those two things at the same time. So for example, on the ZX80, when you press the key on the keyboard, the processor, of course, has to then respond and say, oh, a key has been pressed. Let me go figure out which key. Uh, let me then respond to the key by putting the appropriate thing on the screen. Because the Z80 was so underpowered, when you push the key, the screen would go black because it couldn't do both things at once. So you stop giving processing the screen, process the keyboard input, and then show whatever's left, right? So every, as you press, the screen would like black, 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 and it was super annoying. So how did they solve that problem on the ZX81? And it's kind of elegant. Um, they didn't want to have a more powerful processor because that would have been very expensive. So what they did is the computer has got two modes that the programmer can set, a fast mode and a slow mode. Uh, the fast mode is what uh, the same behavior as, a, as, the, as its predecessor, which is basically whatever you do, don't worry about the screen, just process the program. And so, yeah, the screen will go, if the CPU is struggling to keep up, it will just not care about the display and it'll favor the program. But in slow mode, it would actually favor the display. So the program would actually run more slowly, uh, basically at a quarter speed, so that it could have enough cycles left over to update the screen. So if you play a game on the uh, ZX81, uh, essentially the computer is only running at a quarter speed so they can keep the screen refreshed and some kind of you know semblance of animation going. Uh, so that's kind of interesting because uh, the screen flashing problem was considered to be one of the great weaknesses of the ZX80 and the way they overcame it was not by you know adding in a bunch more expensive hardware, it was just by moving the choice of how you wanted to handle that problem over to the programmer so the programmer could decide based on their scenarios, their concerns, and what priorities they had, they could make the choice, uh, you know, to favor one way or the other. So that's a really nice solution to that. Okay, so uh, that is the uh, Sinclair ZX81 or, you know, Timex Sinclair TS1000, whichever way you like to call it. Uh, next time, what we're going to do is we're going to up our skills a little bit and we're going to open up the original Nintendo Famicom uh, and see how that differs from this one. So until then, take care.